Well, good morning, everyone. It's sure good to see you. All right. I seem, I seem to always have that effect on you. But anyways, I believe that God's going to teach you and I something here that's going to make a big difference in our lives in just a moment. We are talking about prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And when it comes to prayer, you and I have issues. We don't know if it works or how it works. We repeat certain phrases over and over. We say interesting things like a hedge of protection, or when people make us food, we pray that God would bless their hands, but apparently we're not interested in God blessing the rest of their body. <laughs> Even if in, we do believe in prayer, we can be highly inconsistent. And so the Lord's Prayer gives us an opportunity to lean in to hear Jesus himself praying. This prayer is recorded twice in the scriptures, once in Luke chapter 11 when the disciples asked, hey Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus gives this prayer that we've now come to know as the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus also gives this prayer, but this time to a much bigger audience as part of the Sermon on the Mount. And what we find are these two accounts of the Lord's Prayer are not identical word for word. And in fact, there are some pretty significant differences. Uh, and what that means is this, this prayer is not meant to be memorized or recited word for word. If that were the case, Jesus certainly could have given us the same prayer twice. But instead, through the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching us some principles that he wants to give to you and I. We take those principles, we use our own words, then as we pray back to God. And so let's get into this Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. It says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. I always fall back on that when we're out at a restaurant with our kids, they're praying and it's going on a little long. I'm like, now is not the time for a long prayer. I'm hungry. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray, and we'll switch now to the King James Version. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first principle that we discovered two weeks ago is that you and I, we have a father. And the first thing that we do when we go in prayer is we remind ourselves just who it is that we're approaching. We must begin to see God accurately the way that Jesus saw him, and Jesus saw him as our Father. Jesus says, we're praying to a loving Father. You don't need to persuade him to care about what you're going through. He knows what you need even before you ask him, and he only thinks good for you. We have been adopted into God's family, so we don't try to need to earn favor to approach God. And so every prayer begins by embracing the fatherhood of God. Last week, we talked about heaven, where our Father lives, and we're told He is there preparing a mansion for us. And that is really good news because this housing market is crazy. <laughs> there are not enough homes. Homes are selling for thirty to $40,000 over asking price. They're being bought with cash, and that is without an inspection. And so this is a crazy housing market, but the good news is our Father is preparing for you a home for eternity, and it's not just a starter home, it's a mansion. Now this week we want to go on to this next phrase, Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? When is the last time in casual conversation someone even mentioned to you that word hallowed? Uh, ladies, was it when you were out with your girlfriends, you're having petite salads and someone notices your new fossil purse and said, that's hallowed. 
Guys, is it when you're at the gym and you put another plate on and they say, wow, them gains are hallowed. <laughs> oh, that hasn't happened? You see, hallowed is an old English word, and to hallow something means to treat it as sacred or as ultimate. It means to seek something above all else, to make something your ultimate concern. It is the most important thing, to make it the most crucial thing, the ultimate aim of your life. To hallow something means I am lifting this up as the most beautiful thing, as the supreme goal of my life. Jesus says this comes first. And it comes first because not only should all prayer be about this, but all of life is meant to be about this. Life works best when we understand we are here to worship God and to bring him honor. When we recognize him, he is the author and the all-important one. And so hallowed be thy name. This is the very first ask of the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever stopped and thought about what is the very first thing that I ask for when I stop to pray? What is my first request each day? So my son Luke, Friday night, he, uh, he headbutted me in my teeth, and so my lips are all swollen this morning. And uh, so I'm going to use him as a sermon illustration all throughout today, kind of payback. So my son, he's two years old, and he wakes up just like clockwork right around 7 a.m. each day. And each morning, he's been thinking about something. He's been dreaming about something all through the night. So he makes a beeline to our bedroom, wakes me up, and he makes his request known. And so um, he knows what he wants in life. I mean, he's going places. He's got a strong will. He's got a temper. I don't know where he got it from. It's clearly not my side of the family. (laughs) Some mornings it's easy. He just says, you know what, Daddy, I want milk, or I want to watch Daniel Tiger Neighborhood. Other mornings he wants peach jello and to play Hungry Hippos. Some mornings he's more bold. He says, I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm trying to teach him, if I take you twice in a year to Chuck E. Cheese, you're doing really good. Some mornings, he'll ask for a smoothie and a car wash. Now, I love to say yes to my kids. But because I love my kids and I love my son, sometimes I have to say no. No, you will not eat any more marshmallows today. You're going to turn into a marshmallow. No, I will not give you any more candy before dinner. And when I tell him no, he becomes a different person. He says, I don't like you. (laughs) You're not my friend. Because you won't give me everything, I can't trust you to give me anything. It's the very same thing that was in the heart of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God says, I'm going to give you this entire garden and you can eat from every tree here. There's just one. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil And in their hearts they said, because God won't give me everything, God won't give me anything. And I wonder how many of us in our prayers, we've started that same way off with God. You know what, God, give me this, give me that. And if you won't give me everything, then I can't trust you to give me anything. What is the very first thing that you ask for when you go to your Heavenly Father? A lot of us go to God and say, you know what, God, I need this. I need a better job. I need you to heal me. I need you to give me peace. I need a girlfriend. Others of us, we ask things for other people. Please provide a job for my dad. Heal my grandma. Some of us, our first ask is for forgiveness. We know we've sinned. We know we have missed the mark. And so we want to clear that up just as soon as possible. And so I don't know what your very first request is, but I would imagine it would fall into one of these areas. And now as we look at Jesus, his prayer, his very first request is, Hallowed be your name. And as he does this, there's one thing that becomes instantly clear, and that is the focus of the prayer is not Jesus himself. It's not his own need. It wasn't somebody else's need. The focus of the Lord's first request 
is God's glory, God's honor. In fact, we'll see in the weeks to come, before Jesus gets to anything of his own needs or mentions any other person, he's already halfway through the prayer. The Lord's Prayer, as you break it apart, there are six different requests in the prayer. The first petition is this, hallowed be thy name. The second one is thy kingdom come. The third one is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's already made three of the requests and he hasn't mentioned anything about himself or another person. And now the fourth petition comes in verse 11. He says, give us this day our daily bread. The full first half of this prayer is all about God. It's all about his glory. This is the focus. And so what does this do for you and I? It means no matter how bad your circumstances might be, no matter how unpleasant your current condition is, no matter how pressing that need is, no matter how heavy the burden it is on your heart, you and I must never begin prayer with me. Then we must never begin by putting our requests first. And even that applies to the most noble of petitions, even the salvation of souls, even interceding for someone else. Jesus doesn't put any of them first. Nothing he asks for has anything to do with a human being first. The Lord Jesus teaches us. And so before everything else, there must be this overriding concern, this overriding passion for God's honor and for his glory and his fame. And even though the two accounts of the Lord's Prayer, they they differ in significant ways, you'll see that these first three petitions are all word for word identical. Because Jesus is telling us, whatever else may change in your life and in your prayers, God's glory is always priority number one. It's an interesting study to look at some of the most famous prayers of Scripture and to see how the heroes of the faith started their prayers. And here's what you'll find. Every great prayer begins like the Lord's Prayer. It is all about the glory of God. Let's look at Daniel. Who of us would not want to live our lives like Daniel did? Daniel 9.4 says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, the Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him, and keep his commandments. In Isaiah 37, it says, And Hezekiah, he prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. And here we see that Hezekiah, he is totally surrounded. Like Sennacherib and the armies of Syria, they have surrounded the city. They're going to tear the walls down. They're going to take the people away as slaves and captives. And the first thing he does is he gets on his knees and he talks about the glory of God. That's a great prayer. You think you've got problems? You have no problems compared to the problems that he had. And yet he doesn't start with his problems. He starts with the glory of God. Second Chronicles 20 Then Jehoshaphat, he stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, The Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. And in this passage, Jehoshaphat again, he is surrounded by armies and he does yet the very same thing. He starts with the glory of God. 1 Kings chapter 8. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel. He spread out his hands towards heaven and said, The Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below, you who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. And so here Solomon, he is ready to dedicate the temple. It is an incredible architectural feat. And yet the very first thing he does is he talks about the glory of God. In Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah, he gets word that the city of Jerusalem is in ruins and the walls are down. But the very first thing he does is he doesn't talk about all of the needs of Jerusalem. 
It says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. You see, Nehemiah, he was faced with the impossible. He was faced with the heartbreaking situation. And yet he starts by talking of the glory of God. Lastly, in 1 Chronicles 29, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor, they come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. That's how David started praying. And I want to ask you, is it any wonder that he got heard? Is it any wonder that he got the attention of heaven? That is the way to start a prayer. You know, the week after Easter, I got a call. And just shortly into the conversation, this is what I was told. Satan has won. Really? I said, girlfriend, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Jesus walked out of a tomb two days ago, and you're going to tell me Satan has won? No, no, no. You don't start a prayer like that. You see, all of the greatest power Prayers of history started with saying, God, to you be the glory and the honor. And you know, it really only makes sense once we've remembered who God is. And we got that clear vision. It makes sense then to say, hallowed be your name. Because the glory of God is the ultimate end of all things. There must be a desire above everything else in our life to lift up God, to request only the things that will lead to glory of God, and we cannot pray effectively unless the glory of God is our overarching motive and passion. It has to be the chief concern of every prayer. We have to be willing to disregard ourselves and our own needs and our problems in that first position to put the glory of God first. And that's how we pray as Jesus has taught us to pray. To go a little bit further, what does it mean to hallow thy name? If we were to go back into biblical times, we would see that the Jews had an unparalleled reverence and respect for God and his holiness. In fact, they had so much respect for God's name that they wouldn't say his name out loud. They believed that God was so holy, so high, and we were so sinful that to even speak that name would somehow bring disgrace upon God. And so they wouldn't speak his name. They wouldn't say Yahweh. They wouldn't say Jehovah. They wouldn't even pronounce it. Instead, in Hebrew, they would say Hashem, meaning the name. They would just refer to the name generically. And so they would say Hashem of the Old Testament or Hashem speaks this. And therefore, when Jesus says, hallowed be thy name, he's referring not just to the name, but to God and all that he is. God revealed himself with many different names. He is Elohim. He is the God of all power. He is El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. He is the God that is sovereign. He is El Yon. He is the most high God. He reveals himself as Jehovah in many different forms, that he is Jehovah Rapha, he is the Lord that heals. He is Jehovah Shammah, he is the Lord who is there. He is Jehovah Jireh, he is the Lord who provides. And he is Jehovah Shalom, he is the Lord that brings us peace. God uses all of these names to describe who he is, and the term thy name encompasses them all. It's the entirety of who God is. Now, when Jesus prays that God would hallow himself, he's praying that he would hallow God. What does that mean? He's praying that 
through his life, let his name would be revered amongst all men and women and children. They would all come to know him and place their honor and trust in him. He's praying that the whole world would come to worship the one true God, to give him the glory and fame that is rightfully his. That's what Jesus is praying here. Jesus says, the very first request that I have is that every human being would come to the place where they would honor and trust your name as they should. That's what Jesus wants. Now, I love to travel around. I love to go in airplanes, but I'm kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because the last few years, I've been getting more and more scared of turbulence. Is anyone else scared of turbulence in planes? Like when it just drops a thousand feet without notice? And so recently, my wife looked over at me and I am clutching the hand rests. She's like, wow, you're sh- sure holding on to the plane pretty tightly. I am. But there's something that I told myself then, and I, I try to remind myself every time of this. When you look out the window and you look at that engine, that's not a Southwest engine or United engine or a Boeing engine. Many of those engines actually have a little RR next to them. And does anyone know what that RR stands for? Rolls Royce. Has anyone ever driven a Rolls Royce? Okay. And so when I see Rolls Royce, that name carries weight with me. You know what? Rolls Royce doesn't make junk. Rolls Royce doesn't make engines that are going to break down halfway through. And so I'm like, that's a Rolls Royce. I'm going to be okay. Now, the reason why I bring that up is I want you to bring a parallel then to the name of Jesus, that his name would be hallowed and respected and revered, the top shelf name. That every time people would hear that name, they would know, I can trust that name. Every time I speak that name and people are being rattled around in the turbulence of life, there would be a reaching out and a clinging to that name, realizing that name never fails. That name always delivers and brings you through. That's what Jesus is praying for when he says, Hallowed be thy name. You cannot read through the Gospels and fully understand what Jesus was fully about unless you understand he had this all-consuming desire to bring glory to God's name. In John chapter 17, we, we find the high priestly prayer of Jesus And he starts it off very similar to what we see in the Lord's Prayer. John 17, 1, it says, After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. The beginning again of Jesus' prayer is to bring glory to God. In John 8, 49, Jesus said, I do not seek glory for myself, but I choose to seek honor for my Father. You'll never understand what made Jesus tick and what drove his life until you understand it was the glory of God as his highest priority. And so if you and I, if we are going to pray like Jesus, and if you and I are going to live like Jesus, we must also be preoccupied with the glory of God. Hallowed be thy name does not mean that you are concerned about mispronouncing God's name. No, what we're praying here is, God, would you use my life to show people your glory? Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, glorify you through my life. And then Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, he goes to a garden to pray. And he says this, Matthew 26, My Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, when Jesus prayed, Hallowed be thy name, he put his life on the line so God could use him to hallow his name. And we need to see that. If we we miss that, we miss the whole point. Praying, Hallowed be thy name, we're asking God, use my life to bring you glory, praying that God would use my life as a vehicle of glory, whether he chooses to do that by bringing you riches or by poverty, 
whether he chooses to bring glory by giving you success or failure, whether he brings glory through your sickness or through your health, your victory or defeat, when we say, hallowed be thy name, we're saying, God, use my life to bring you glory, however that comes to me, and maybe however low I have to go. Sometimes it's through the deep waters that we bring glory to God. God, glorify your name. If we're honest, a prayer like that ought to give us pause. If we really understood what hallowed be thy name all involved, maybe we would be hesitant to pray it. Because truth be told, sometimes, sometimes God prefers to use us in failure, and sometimes he shows greater glory in our weakness. Sometimes God prefers to use us in a weakness and defeat as opposed to success. And so if you really want your life to honor God, you've got to be ready for him to do it in both the good and in the bad, because that's how God does it. Anybody can handle winning. Winning is easy and fun. Anyone can fake humility when you're up on top, right? But when you lose and you can still shake the other team's hands, when the CDC says it's safe to do so, when you can congratulate those who have beat you and not lose your temper, that glorifies God. And so this is why we pray, hallowed be thy name, before we ask for anything for ourselves. Because if this is not our attitude, then every prayer we pray is just asking for jello and marshmallows and hungry hippos. You'll pray off base and you'll pray powerless prayers unless the glory of God dominates everything. Unless you're willing for the glory of God to be shown in every part of your life, whatever it takes. And so hallowed be thy name. This is the first request of any prayer like Jesus. And so here's what's going to happen. As you pray this prayer now, um, you're going to get halfway through your prayer and you haven't mentioned anything about yourself. You haven't mentioned anything about another person. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a new perspective. And you're going to begin to think, you know what, maybe, maybe that new job isn't so important. Maybe God has me where I am for a reason. Maybe that relationship, I see it in a new direction. Again, as we seek the glory of God first. I'm convinced the reason a lot of us, we pray for wrong things and wrong reasons is because we skip this step. We don't pray, hallowed be thy name. And so we're just asking, God, would you be famous? God, would you be worshipped? God, would you be known and recognized all across Milwaukee? And as we let this prayer work its way through our hearts and our minds, it changes the way we pray. And so I just want you to think, is that where you're at today, where you could honestly pray, you know what, God, I want my life to honor you. God, I want my life to bring you glory. God, I'm willing to ask that you would honor yourself before I ask you to fix my problems. Let's take a moment. We're going to pray, and then we're going to put this into practice. And so, Lord Jesus, it is all about you. It is all about your glory. It's all about your purposes. Lord, we want everyone to know the name of Jesus. It is a supreme name. It is a name that can be trusted. It is a name of power. It is a name that gets results. God, it is a name that brings us through the storms of life. It is the name that heals. It is the name that provides. It is the name that reconciles. And yet, Lord, your glory comes first. And so, Lord Jesus, help us just today to take inventory. God, help us not hallow anything more than your name. God, help us not to hallow a career. Help us not to hallow a relationship status. God, help us not to hallow retirement or, or earning more money or more prestige. 
Help us to put you first. God, help us to pray this prayer every day. Lord, you tell us we shouldn't be like a hypocrite. We don't need to be praying it out in front of everyone. Where the rubber meets the road is in private, in closed rooms. Where we just worship you, there's no agenda other than to say, I want to hallow you in your name. So God, work this prayer through our hearts and our minds. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with us now. Our worship team is going to lead us in prayer and just in worship in just a moment. Again, this is how we hallow the name of the Lord. But if you want to say that prayer where you're at, you're welcome to do that. If you want to come to this altar and maybe you make a fresh commitment, you'd say, you know what? My prayers have not been about the glory of God first and foremost. And I just want to start that off. I invite you to pray with me here at this altar. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now Christ, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of
Amen. We want everyone to know that name, the name of Jesus. You know, a lot of people, they struggle with worry and anxiety, and they'll say something like this, you know what? I bring my request to the Lord. I mean, I have prayed about this, and I still worry. I still have anxiety. And I believe in what we talked about today, there is a great key for us here, is that we have gone, we have first brought our request to the Lord, and we have skipped the whole part about His glory being first. And so I encourage you, if that's where you're at, and you're still worrying about something, go to your prayer closet each day this week and say, you know what, God, your glory first. And you're gonna experience the peace of God in a new way. I want to close with this prayer that I found. This is kind of a paraphrase of what we've talked about today. Hallowed be thy name. Father, your reputation is at stake in me today. People will either hallow you or hate you based on what they see in me. May the Spirit of God live through me. Lord, may I do nothing to debase or defame you today. Lord, may you cause every minor detail of my life to be a credit to you. Lord, may you cause my life to reflect to people who and what you really are. Father, may people be drawn to honor you and revere you and glorify your name because of my life. And Lord, even through my pain and even through my heartache, may you get glory for your name. May people come to embrace you and be saved so that they can pray right along with me. Hallowed be thy name. Let's pray. And so, Lord Jesus, Lord, help us to pray this this week and in our prayer closets away from everyone else. God, let there be times where we just worship you and say what a beautiful, powerful name is you. Lord, we believe that you have changed us, you've challenged us, and I pray you go with your people now. Lord, let us spread that name everywhere we go, the hope that we have uniquely in you. Give your people a wonderful day of rest and enjoyment. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.